still, are we still, we still have a couple of extra tickets for the Monster Jam? Three extra. So, due to a couple of people being sick or things going on, we do have three tickets extra for the Monster Jam. If anybody else wants to go this afternoon at 2 o'clock in Greensboro and you didn't know about it, feel free to do that. Just see Julie quickly after church because we're going to be getting out of here. Um, but here we go. Today, we're in week three of our gospel series here uh, this year starting off. And looks like we're going to have probably two more weeks of the gospel series uh, in this. So we're going to go through the end of January. Then we're going to move into another series, one that's going to take place like immediately right after the gospel is really introduced in the Bible to us. Uh, if you remember, uh, from week one, I kind of mentioned briefly that I'm going to try to tell in the first couple of series of the year at least a small kind of short story of part of the New Testament as we go along the story. So we're starting this year off by looking at gospel. Uh, first week we looked at what the gospel is and that it's more than just saying Jesus died for our sins. It's that Jesus is the Christ and that starts from his pre-existence all the way through to when he will return. It's a whole message of Jesus. Last week we looked at why the gospel is important to us. Today we're going to answer this question. Who is the God of the gospel? Very important question. Because we typically think of the gospel, as we saw last week, in terms of something that saves us. The gospel, the message of Jesus Christ and Jesus saves us from sin, saves us from hell. But we also saw last week it saves us for something. To do, to do God's work, it saves us for eternal life. But we don't typically think of the gospel in ways of God revealing who he is through the gospel. But in the gospel, the Trinity is unveiled to us. The Trinity. Um, it's not just something that was added into the gospel, the Bible message, after everything was done. Now, the Bible doesn't ever use the word Trinity. The Trinity is just described in the Bible. And we're going to see that today. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of those concepts. It's one of the beliefs of the Christian faith <clears throat> that can be the most difficult for many Christians to grasp. It's also one of those things really to me that just really comes down to how strong your faith is. And if you truly believe that the Bible is infallible, that means that it's perfect. And if you truly believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, then the Trinity is also something that you have to have your faith and your belief in as well. Because the scripture is full of talk of the Trinity. So what is the Trinity? And what we're going to do today is not a full explanation of the Trinity and all of their roles. It's a brief description of what the Trinity is and then we'll look at each person. Trinity basically means that there are three persons. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But one God. And throughout the scriptures... We see consistently God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt that the scriptures not just contain and talk about these three, but highlight each one of them and their purposes. So we're going to kind of look at those today. And I think it's difficult for people to grasp how one God can be three. Then again... When you think about the things God has already done from creation all the way through up to now and the things God can do, it's difficult for us to grasp as human beings anyway. There's a story about St. Augustine. It says that one day he was just trying to wrap around his brain the explanation of the Trinity. So he goes for a walk. He's turning it over in his mind. One God, but three persons. Three persons. But not three gods, still just one. He kept asking himself, what does it mean? How can it be explained? How can I take it in? How can my mind take it in, he said. And he was walking down the road, and he goes to the ocean, sees a small boy there. The boy's digging a hole, so he walks over to see what's going on. This boy is taking, going over to the ocean, picking up water in his hands, coming back, dumping it in the hole. And Augustine asked him what he was doing. He says, well, I'm trying to get all the water out there into this hole right here. So Augustine asks, is it even possible to get all that water into this little hole? And it was then that it dawned on Augustine, he said, if the water of the ocean cannot be contained in this little hole, 
And how can the infinite God be contained in my mind? And I think that's kind of important for us to understand. Now we can have faith in the Trinity. We can truly believe that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit can do all things, even things that are impossible for us. But to truly grasp and truly understand the power and the might that comes along with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's really too much for our imperfect human minds. So there's always been that question, even in the church, how can there be three gods that make up one? I remember one of my Bible professors explained it briefly this way in Bible college. He said, imagine you have a man named Robert. Well, Robert is the father of two kids. Robert is also the husband of Mary. Robert is also the son of his parents. The same man, three different roles, three different ways to be known. He's a father, a husband, and a son. But he's still one person. Now that certainly does not in any way explain everything there is about the Trinity and how the Trinity works. The Trinity goes so much deeper than that, more than what we can really cover in one sermon. As I said with that illustration with St. Augustine, it's truly impossible for our imperfect human minds to fully grasp and understand all there is to know about the one true living God. But even Jesus makes it clear that they are one. In John 14, Jesus said this in verse 9. He said, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Just a couple of verses later, in verse 11, Jesus says this, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. It's a difficult concept, as I say, for our minds to grasp. But the three are eternal. They always have been. A lot of people think of God coming first and then Jesus and the Spirit. Never worked that way. John opens up his gospel, the gospel of John, by telling us that Jesus was with God in the beginning. The Spirit of God, it's seen throughout the Old Testament from Genesis all the way through up into the New Testament and even today. And the reason that Christians agree about the Trinity is that to deny the Trinity would be to deny the gospel of Jesus Christ. The activities of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're described and they are talked about throughout the entire Bible. But the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ being sent by the Father and then sending the Holy Spirit after Jesus was dead, buried, resurrected, and ascended kind of shows us the Trinity for the first time in their roles, you could say. Because it's at that point that you can go back and look through the Old Testament and really see that God has always been three. But the historical events that show the gospel are these. The Father sent the Son, and they sent the Spirit. So who is the Father of the gospel? In terms of the gospel, who is God the Father? This is the one true living God who made himself available, who revealed himself to Abraham, to his descendants, to David, to many others. God entered in, God the Father entered into this legally binding covenant, really, with his people. And it started with Abraham. The oneness of God. It's kind of expressed early on in the Old Testament when they get the law that God gave to the Israelites. In Deuteronomy 6.4, we read this. Here, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. So it's clear to me from this passage that there is one true living God. And over the course of time, God promised in the Old Testament to send a Savior into the world. And when the time was right, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. That's part of the gospel message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. That's part of the gospel message that we continue to preach now, almost 2,000 years later. And although Israel knew there was one God, the gospel revealed God to be the father of a very unique son. And if we suggest, or if we kind of make a claim that God wasn't the father until the Virgin Mary became pregnant with Jesus, we would be wrong. 
Because the scriptures tell us that Jesus pre-existed with God. That he was part of God's predetermined plan long before Jesus appeared as a man. And so think about this. If God became the Father only when Jesus came to earth, that would mean that God had to make a fundamental change about who he is. And the Bible teaches us that God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the events of the gospel, they show us that God is as at least two persons, the eternal Father and the eternal Son. We see evidence of this in the first few verses of John and his gospel. In John 1, verses 1 through 2, we read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. As you can see there, Word is capitalized in those verses. Because John wasn't writing about a word like a language. He says that he was with God in the beginning. But who? Who is John writing about? Well, in that same chapter, in verse 14, he makes it clear. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John makes it clear in the first chapter of his gospel that Jesus was with God in the very beginning, way back when all things were being created, and that God sent his Son to this earth. He dwelt among us. And here's something to remember. We're talking here about God the Father. But when any one person of the Trinity seems to be involved in rescuing or saving someone, all three are involved. Consider the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This event really required mutual involvement. It's clear that the scriptures teach that God raised Jesus from the dead, right? Peter tells us that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 24. He says that he raised him and God raised him up again. It's also in other places in the New Testament. So God raised Jesus from the dead. But what did Jesus say about himself in John 2, 19? Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, when Jesus was talking about a temple there, he wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his resurrected body. But notice he says, I will raise it up. So when one person of the Trinity is working, you better believe all three of them. The Son always participates in the Father's work. And so does the Spirit. And they all work together in us as Christians also. In John 5, 19, we read these words. But if the Spirit who raised, a spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are all involved in one another's decisions, in one another's actions. Now this is important in a way because when we say the Father sent the Son, you could ask, did he? Of course he did. The Bible teaches that in John 3, 16. But we can take it in a way that it says the Father sent the Son without the Son having any knowledge or any choice in the matter or whatever. Jesus knew all along why he was coming to earth. And yet he came to do the will of the Father. In professional wrestling, you watch any of that stuff. Me and my dad used to love watching it. Whether you think it's real or not. In professional wrestling, it's entertaining to watch. But they can have these people to work together that make up a tag team. They tag each and another out of the match. They work together to accomplish what needs to be done. So when one gets tired or whatever, or they're hurt, and they tag the other person, the other person comes in and starts wrestling. And when they do it well, good things happen. Sometimes you see tag team matches that are two versus two, sometimes three versus three, or even more. No matter the size of the teams, they got to work together. Well, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit make up one fantastic tag team. Some would call the Father the ringleader of all of them. But in reality, they all work together. And the purpose of each is equally important. God the Father, He appeared to mankind, spoke to mankind, created all things, but He did it all with the Son and the Spirit. 
Now, who is the Spirit in the gospel? The Holy Spirit, the one member of the team that you could say, that I would say is least known and most forgotten. Doesn't get talked about as much in church as God the Father or God the Son, Jesus. Which to me, when you think about it, it's really sad and it's inexcusable on our part in today's church because the Spirit is the one that we have with us as Christians everywhere we go. Francis Chan, a famous preacher and author in today's world, wrote a book a few years ago called The Forgotten God. And it's a book about how we have forgotten the Holy Spirit and His role. We've forgotten about the power we receive in the Holy Spirit. Somewhere along the way, we've forgotten about that power. And we've forgotten that when we're being challenged, when we're being convicted, it's not always just our thoughts. It's typically the Holy Spirit working in us. And so we've got to get back to recognizing and understanding that God sent His Holy Spirit to dwell in us as Christians then and still does today. Scripture describes the Spirit saving, act, saving activity in this way. That God the Father sent the Son and that they both, the Father and the Son, sent the Spirit to us. The Spirit of God. It's an active force. Not like Star Wars. But it's an active force throughout the Scriptures. The Spirit, like Jesus, was not an afterthought either. It's not like God the Father and God the Son sat around one day and decided, I think it would be a good idea to have a spirit to help us out. And they created it. See, just as Jesus was there in the beginning, the spirit was there in the beginning. In Genesis 1, 2, it says this, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. So what a scene that would have been if we could have just watched the masterpiece of creation taking place. Some people love to watch a painter paint something quickly on a canvas. But imagine the scene of creation, what it must have looked like. And all three were there making it happen. And it doesn't end there. The Spirit works throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament. The Spirit of God was the driving force when the church was being started. When Jesus ascended back into heaven, he told his disciples, wait, and I'll send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. Ten days pass from the time of his ascension back into heaven to the day of Pentecost, to the day the church officially began in Acts chapter 2. And during that time, the disciples were together. They were praying. They were in one place. And in Acts chapter 2, we read that a loud noise came from heaven. It was a loud wind. I read recently that the word used for that meant it was a loud wind like the wind of a tornado. But this loud wind comes. The Bible tells us that tongues of flame come down and rest upon each of them. And the Bible tells us that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus told them he would do. Then they were able to speak. To this large crowd of people, thousands of people in their own languages. They were hearing it all in their own language. Can you imagine the crowd? We know there was at least 3,000 there because about 3,000 were baptized, those who believed. There were more people there than normal because it would have been a Jewish holiday. And as we do in America, what do we do if we're walking somewhere or standing somewhere and something strange happens nearby? We tend to be a little nosy. We try to look over there or walk over there and see what happened. I imagine many people began to gather around in that scene in Acts chapter 2 because of this loud noise. And then to see these apostles speaking and hearing them in their own language. The Bible tells us that they even thought they were drunk. They were shocked. And at that point, Peter stands up and began to preach to them what we call the very first gospel sermon. That Jesus is the Christ. The book of Acts, it's called by most people the Acts of the Apostles. 
You could equally call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that gave these apostles the power to do what they did throughout the entire book of Acts and after. That's who the Spirit is in the gospel. The Spirit of God dwelling inside of us as Christians to lead us, to help us, to comfort us, to guide us. And finally and quickly, who is Jesus in the gospel? Some people would say he's the only one of the three that has a name. But that would be inaccurate. God the Father has a name as well, Yahweh. But Jesus, he's the one we talk about the most. He's the one we teach about. He's the one we preach about. Understandably so, right? He's that one central figure of the three that is most known all over the world. He was the one willing to come to earth. Knowing what a mess we had already made of him. Knowing what he was coming for, he was the one who was willing. Jesus, God the Son, had a special role in all of this. That even though all three are very active, and all three work together, Jesus is the one who became fully human. And what's amazing is that even though he became fully human, he never ceased, he never stopped being God. What a role he played, fully human and yet fully divine. And although he could have used, it, used his God powers at any time to clear himself, to save himself, to rescue himself, this Jesus, God the Son, was committed to doing what he came to do. Think about that for a second. With Jesus being man, still God, on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, he ultimately shows us at that moment just how selfless God really is. He humbled himself for me and for you. And for us to be conformed to God's image, we take up our cross willingly. We bear his name. We love. We serve. But this Jesus, God the Son, didn't just die. He rose again. He appeared to many people. He did human things once again while still being God. And then he ascended back into heaven and is there today. The right hand of God, God the Father, where he rules as the King of Kings. Now I said quite a bit less about Jesus because he's the one we talk about every single week pretty much. He's also the one I talked about earlier when I talked about God the Father. He's the one that gets the most attention out of the three. But all three are equally important. The gospel. I hope what we're seeing in the gospel in this series is that it's much more than just saying Jesus died for my sins. Certainly is a part of it. I've said that over and over. That is a part of the message of the gospel. It's a big part of the message. But the gospel begins from his pre-existence all the way until he returns. Today we've seen that the gospel message involves all three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's who the God of the gospel is. And remember, they all work together. When we think that one of them is working in us to save us and rescue us, actually they're all working. It's truly a tough concept for many people to grasp. Too much for our simple little minds. It goes back to that matter of faith that we have. But with God, all things are possible. That's our God of the gospel. A God who continually does the impossible. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you for joining us. This sermon's a lot different than many others that we hear and preach. We don't talk a whole lot about the Trinity in that way in the church, but the simple truth is there is God the Father, there is God the Son, there is God the Holy Spirit. They have different roles. It's the same God. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this this morning, whether you're with us in person, whether you're watching us live on Facebook. But God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, so that we could have the hope of eternal life. So that we could have our sins washed away. But not just to be saved from something. Remember last week. But saved for something. To do God's work here on earth. 
and to be saved for eternal life. If you've never made that decision to give your life to Jesus Christ, to put your faith in Him, to confess Him before others, to repent, to place your allegiance in Jesus Christ, really, to be immersed in the waters, to have your sins washed away, to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, you always have the opportunity to do that. We're going to stand and we're going to sing our hymn of invitation here this morning. We're going to sing song number 173, first and last verses of Are You Washed in the Blood?